Break a Leg is a book written recently by Peter Sheridan. It's a memoir. And where the name comes from, where the title comes from, is the, the old theatrical expression of break a leg. And where that comes about is that it's not a good idea on, in the theatre, they think, to say, good luck. So they say, break a leg. So to start this morning's session, I think you could wish me break a leg. <laughs> and where the expression comes from, I've, I've looked it up several times, but the one that interests me most is that as the actor is going out onto the stage, generally the guy who operates the curtain is the guy who says to him, just he or she as they're going out on the stage says, break a leg. And where it comes from is years past, there was timber battens in the big heavy curtains that they let up and down. And those battens were called legs. So if you had a really good performance and you got a whole load of curtain calls, you broke a leg. And that's where the expression came from. And in reading Peter's book, and it's interesting that I find now in business, and I've been training people since the 80s, I find I'm reading more creative books than I am reading business books, which in most cases I find deadly boring. So I find p books like Peter Sheridan's book much more enjoyable and much more interesting. I get some very good ideas out of it. And one of the ideas is a quote that he put into the book, and it's by a man called John McGrath. And interestingly, as we go through the presentation, every time the screen is orange, it's your opportunity to read what it says on the screen, and it's my opportunity to stay quiet and gather, gather my thoughts. So if you just take a moment to read that. And isn't that the truth of it? If you thought you were going to be bored here this morning, you wouldn't turn up. So you expect to be entertained, you expect to learn something, but you also expect to enjoy something. Brandon Kennelly said there was two requirements for education. You needed to have the confidence to ask questions, and you must have fun. And that's what theatre people do. They help us have fun and enjoy themselves. There's a book written by the comedian Bob Munkhouse, and what Bob Munkhouse says, it doesn't matter whether you're in building or banking, construction or cosmetics, as soon, as soon as you stand in front of an audience, it's show business. And there is an element of show business, and if you want to be remembered for your pitches and stand out, you need to build an element of show business, and you need to be entertaining. Um, the title of this session is How to Deliver Compelling and Successful Pitches. That's one the Sales Institute sort of draw, dreamt up. I like the much shorter one of Pitch to Win. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. How are you going to pitch and win business? Because that's why you're here. That's what you want to know. Um, interestingly, I was working with the Wire team, which is Telefonica's high potential startup companies, and Liam Casey spoke at it, who owns PCH, Corkman, who now has a billion dollar company in China. And that's what he said. Find your story and get people to believe in you. And the reality is you wouldn't do business knowingly with anyone you didn't trust. Isn't that, isn't that the reality of it? You, you want to do business with people you trust, you want to do people who, people who you believe in. And that's, that was his advice to the sort of high potential startups, and it's my advice. I like that line. So the Aristo philosophy is, stop sermonizing. It's the reason churches are empty. I regularly say in buildings like this to universities, why would you want to be called a lecturer? Who the hell wants to be lectured to? I don't. Slide presentations, most of them I see are boring and uninteresting, and the simple guide would be, unless there's 40 or 50 people in the room, I don't think you need a slide presentation. Just come and talk to me, engage me in conversation. Leave the slide presentation for this site of event. And most sales presentations are uninteresting. I don't want to be sold to. If you know yourself when you, you're sitting at home, you're watching the television, you see a guy coming up the driveway, and you know he's going to be selling you something. And the last thing you want to do is answer the door. When the guy is selling you Sky or UPC or whoever it is, you don't answer the door. Electricity. So stop selling. That would be my advice to you. And I'll tell you how to get over that. Uh, the philosophy for Arista would be have a conversation with people, whether it's one, whether it's five, whether it's 50, or whether it's 500. Have a conversation. Engage people in conversation and they listen to you. The objectives of a pitch, as I would see it, is to do a number of things. 
to tell a client that you understand the problem better than anybody else. That's what we're here. We know your business. We understand your business. Reassure them that you solve it better than anybody else. We've done this before. We can do this again. Persuade them that you've solved the solution problem many times before. These are the key messages that any pitch needs to deliver, sales presentation or pitch, and demonstrate that you're easy to work with. If you come in, you're tense, you're anxious, you're uptight, I don't think I'm going to want to work with you. I don't. So you need to come in, you need to be in charge, you need to be comfortable, you need to be relaxed, you need to be knowledgeable. So that's what we're going to talk about as, as, as the morning goes on. Let me tell you how you do that. Uh, pitch to win, it's about relationships, stupid. And where that expression comes from is James Carville was the campaign manager for Bill Clinton when Bill was running for election. And every morning James Carville had to say to Bill and the team, it's about the economy, stupid. Talk about the economy, forget about everything else, it's always about the economy. And at the end of it he put stupid just to reinforce it. Don't talk about anything else, talk about the economy. And I would say to you as a, as a person who's worked in training and coaching salespeople since the 80s, it's always about relationships, it's never about the technology. It's the relationship you build up with people and if you don't build up those relationships you're simply stupid and that's what you've got to do. It's build relationships, create relationships. Take a moment to read it. That's what you need to do. Be a conversationist, talk to the other person about their problems, about their issues. Let me tell you a value story. And the problem really is that we don't talk nearly enough about value. We talk about our product, we talk about what our product does, but we don't talk about the value of our product. And some years ago, I was working with a large security company. And they had tended for one of the hospitals for a big contract, for the security contract. And they didn't get it. And the sales manager asked me to come and look at the presentation. And the presentation was, and you can have a think about your presentations and does it sound similar. The presentation started off with putting it, paraphrasing it. We're wonderful, we're terrific, we're great, we're marvellous. You'd be a gobshite if you didn't deal with us. That's what it is. That's what the presentation said. And I said to him, do you have the security contract for other hospitals? And he said, oh yeah, we have it for Tala Hospital and we do Temple Street Hospital. I said, when were you going to mention that? And he flicked through the presentation. At slide 32, they were going to mention that they had other security contracts uh, for hospitals. So I said, why don't we take that, bring it right to the beginning, and then start the conversation by saying, we have the contract for Tallinn, we have the contract for Temple Street Hospital. Let me tell you about the issues that they have and would you have similar issues. Now you're straight into a conversation about their problems. As a result of this conversation with this company and they engaged me to do work, I went to talk to the hospital and I went to talk to the senior buyer in the hospital about this experience. And he said to me, oh, let me tell you what happens. He said, the most boring day of my life is the last Friday of every month because that's when we review tender documents. That's when we get the teams in, we give them an hour to pitch to us. And he says seven or eight teams will pitch and they'll all pitch for an hour. And at the end of the day, they've all washed into one or the other. We couldn't remember one from the other, nothing stands out. And he said on this particular situation, the issue we had in the hospital was we had no parking. It's subsequently been solved. They now solve the parking problem by building more car parks. But at the time, they had no parking. So he said, the issue we have in the hospital is that it, people park on WL Alliance, people park in ambulance bays, people just abandon their cars, and they come in. That's fair enough. They're coming in with their loved ones, they're concerned, and the one thing they want to do is get their loved ones into the hospital. So he said, that's our issue. He said, not one of the seven companies who pitched turned up and said, we see you have a parking problem. Let us tell you how you'd solve it. And he said the first company to have said that to us would have got the contract because they understood our issues and they understood our concerns. So the question I would ask you is do you know when you're turning up the pitch and present to companies, do you know where you add value? Do you know what it is is their problem and how you can add value and solve that problem? Because that's the key, that's the key issue. Um, I fully understand what you're trying to do. If you say that to the client, it greatly helps them. And demonstrate that you have a much better understanding than your competitors. Now, I've seen that several of you making notes. I did engineering in Bolton Street when I was a young man. Not today, nor yesterday. And we had an old railway engineer who was, the, who was our teacher. And when we came into the class, 
he said to us, when I'm speaking to you, I want you to look at me. He said, I don't want you looking down, I don't want you writing. He says, when I'm speaking to you, I want you to look at me. He says, I'll give you the notes at the end, or I'll give you time to take notes at the end, but when I talk, I want you to look at me. And how he ensured that you did that, was he true chalk at you if you didn't? And you put, as soon as you look down, you've got a beloved talk at the side of the head. So the, the reason I'm telling you this story is you're very welcome to the presentation. We'll happily send it to you. So if it saves you taking all those notes, please, please do. I'm only too happy to send it to you. Uh, now, take a, take a moment to read. When I started in sales, you could turn up without an appointment. When I started in sales, you could get in to see people, probably with a phone call. When I started in sales, people were, had time to speak to you, people had time to engage with you. Now you can't get past the gate, you can't even get them to answer the phone. Uh, you send three emails and they might answer them. So times have got a lot more difficult. So when you do get the opportunity to get in front of someone, you better know exactly what you're going to talk about and how you're going to solve problems for them because the time for chit-chat and sort of conversation and all of that is gone. This is what Deirdre said about Irish companies going to Germany. Germans won't give you that time. Get to the business. How are you going to solve a problem? I didn't expect you to fly all the way here to have a chit-chat and have coffee. Get to the point straight away. And it's got like that in Ireland now as well. That's what you've got to do. You've got to turn up knowing what problem you solve for this particular company and how you do that. Let me tell you the simple three steps. I regularly hear people telling me about 12 step sales pitches and 15 step sales pitches, sales pitches and all the rest of it. There's three. They're very simple. The basics are, in preparation, you need to have the R conversation with the client. The R conversation is, who are you? What are you? What are your issues? What are your concerns? Why would that be important to you? If we could do that, how would that help you? You need to have all of that, that conversation. In that conversation, someone said at the last sales meeting uh, that the average sales presentation is now 45 minutes long. So I would be suggesting to you, if it is 45 minutes long, the R conversation should be a half an hour of that. What are you? What are your concerns? If we could do that, how would that help you? Why would that be important to you? What would it mean to you? What would, how would that add value to your organization? When they tell you all of that, and when you know all of that, um, you can go away and prepare your presentation or prepare your proposal. Um, and then when you know that and when you're very specific about what you can do and how you can help them, then you can very specifically say, so as a result of what you told me, let me tell you very specifically what we can do for you. And when we do that, and my suggestion would be you spend the least amount of time in the do, because most people know what you do and it's not all that terribly exciting anyhow. Uh, had a great conversation with the flow gas people who told me all about their competitors in about five minutes this morning and it was really interesting because I had a completely different view on it. But the people aren't really that interested in what you do. They assume that you know, you, if you say you can do something, you can do it. So be brief about the do and this is where, in reality where most of us are most comfortable and where we're happy to bore the client for, for hours. Let me tell you what we do. No one's interested. So very briefly, as a result of what you've told us and the issues that you have and the concerns that you have, let me tell you very specifically what we can do. And when we do that, let me tell you what you're going to get. And then you finish the conversation by discussing how they're going to be better as a result of what the piece of advice or the suggestion you're going to give them. Because that's the only thing they're interested in is how they're better as a result of what you're going to do for them. They're not interested in any of They probably even aren't interested in how you do it. They just want to know how they're going to be better. So they're the very simple three steps. So that's preparation for the proposal, preparation for the pitch. Then when it comes back to um, what you'll find out in the R conversation is the situation appraisal, the objectives of the client, how, what, how the client would measure success, what would be a success for them. You may think you know, but it's far better if they tell you. What would be a measure of success? and what would be the value to the organization, their organization. They're the, they're the things you've got to find out in the R conversation. When you do that, then you can come back and say, so as a result of that, let me tell you how we're better at doing this than anybody else. 
Let me tell you how we've delivered this numerous times before to similar organizations and how it's worked. And then finally, when you come to proposal delivery, you change the structure slightly because what you're now saying is, as a result of what you told me, this is the situation appraisal and these were your objectives, is that right? You get their agreement and then you simply say, so the measure of success will be and the value to your organization will be. And this isn't guesswork because that's what they've told you. That's what they want. So all you're doing is you're giving them back what they said they wanted. And when you do that, you'll be successful. That's, that's the simple structure for a pitch sales presentation. Most boring day of the month. Uh, I talked to you about the hospital. Interestingly, when I was talking to that man um, in the hospital, he said, this is the most boring day of my month, when I listened to seven people boring on about presentations. And the other example he gave me was, he said, we were going out for the facilities contract for the hospital four or five years ago, when the MRSA bug was at the height of its sort of virility. Everyone was talking about it. It was on every newspaper. This is actually a picture from a, a video clip that they did in a hospital in Birmingham to teach the staff about MRSA, and that's what they're trying to do with MRSA uh, and the MRSA bug. But what the hospital in Dublin said to me was, we went out for a facilities contract. The people came in, they pitched for Now, bearing in mind, a facilities contract for a hospital, this is a multi-million pound contract. And what he said was everyone came in and told us how wonderful they were, how great they were, how terrific they were, how marvellous they were, how you'd be a gobshite if you didn't deal with them, but no one talked to us about our problem. And at the time, their biggest concern and their biggest issue was the MRSA bug. And they had things which he told me were called MRSA chillers. And they took water and they chilled it down, and in chilling it down, they, they killed the bug. He said not one of the companies who pitched for the contract asked us how we dealt with the MRSA issue, asked us to see the MRSA chillers, or did anything. They just came in and did the same pitch that they had done everywhere else. And he said, so what happens then at the end of the day, and I know this is the, you all go back to your bosses and you go back to your companies and you say this thing. What he said was, and you go back and you say, we lost out on price, the others were cheaper. What he said to me was at the end of the day, all of the presentations wash into one to another. We can't remember what the first guy said. We can't remember what the seventh guy said. We don't remember. There's nothing. So we sit there and we say, what do we do? How do we give this contract out? And invariably he says, should we give it to the cheapest? Because they've no other choice. They don't see the value. They haven't been pointed out the value of your organization. So unless you point out the value, you're going to lose out on price. And if you go back and say to your boss or say to yourself, we lost out on price, you didn't lose out on price. You lost out because you didn't show the value of what you do. And when you show the value of what you do, and if you do it well enough, people will pay additional and people will pay for the value and you won't lose out on price. It's very easy to lose out on price. Most boring day. Told you that, six to eight people. So you've got to make your solution stick. If you're one of six or seven or eight, how are you going to be memorable? How are you going to be the one that's remembered at the end of the day? And some of that comes back to what I said right at the beginning. It's just show business. It's being memorable. It's making it stick. It's, you know yourself when you go to a good movie. It's a, and it's interesting. When you go to a good movie, you judge the good movie, whether it was good or not, by whether it had a good ending. You can sit an hour through a movie, and if it has a crap ending, it's just a disappointment. If it has a really good ending, like The Sixth Sense or something like that, you just, you're talking about it for days later. So if you have a really good, exciting ending to your pitch, you're going to be successful. I want you to imagine a picture. You've been in, you've delivered your pitch, and you're leaving the room. And as you're leaving the room, the guy you've pitched to, his boss is walking into the room. And you go out and his boss walks in and his boss says to the guy sitting at the table, what were they talking to you about? What would you want them to say? And if he starts talking about what you do, you're not a success. If he starts talking about, oh, they're going to, they're going to supply X number of security guards and they're going to have cars patrolling and they're going to do this and they're going to do that and they're going to do the other. Now I'm thinking money and cost and all of that sort of thing. If he said, if we take the hospital example, if as his boss walks in and you walk out and his boss says, 
What are they talking to you about? And he says, they're going to solve our parking problem. You're going to get the contract because that's what his boss wants to know. Not about the technology or anything else you do or how many security guards you're going to provide. This company said they can solve our parking problem. You're going to get the contract. Uh, so that's my message for you. You've got to be absolutely clear. Ask yourself when you're driving back this afternoon or whatever, what would you want the boss to say? What would you say to the boss about your idea? And if it's, if it's talking about the value you offer and the advantages you offer, you're a success. If it's talking about what you do, hmm, not so sure. Put it very simply, and if you remember nothing else from today, if you remember this, I want you to talk worm and not cake. And let me tell you the example of that. If you went fishing, would you catch many fish if you didn't have bait on a hook? Doesn't work, it doesn't. You need some bait on the hook. Now, I like cake. I like cake, I have a sweet tooth, I'm very fond of cake. When I'm out to dinner, I hate being out to dinner with my wife, because every time I'm out to dinner and I'm having dessert, my wife says, do you need that? Takes all the good out of it. <laughs> so I'll tell when I'm out to dinner and I don't have my wife with me, it's great, I can have a dessert I want. But I like cake. But in reality, do fish like cake? No, fish don't like cake. Fish like worms. So what you've got to do is you've got to be talking worm. If you're talking worm, if you're talking about what the client likes and what the client wants, you'll be a success. What most of us are doing, and I'm as guilty as this sometimes as the rest of you, is I'm thinking about what I want. I need the order, I need the contract, I need the money, I need to get this job, I need to fill next month, or whatever that is. We're all doing that. But the interesting thing and the fascinating thing, and I've been telling this story for a long, long time, and it only dawned on me recently that in reality, this is a win-win situation. Because if you talk about worm, you'll get the cake, won't you? So it's a win-win situation. So all you need to do is just reverse it. Talk worm, and you'll get cake. So if you remember nothing else from today, I want you to say it was Andrew Kyo who told me to talk worm. And if you do that, I'll be happy, and we'll all be successful. Now, let me tell you, how do you do that? Because obviously that's, that's sort of sometimes what we find is the most difficult thing is actually stand up in front of an audience and do what I'm doing now. It's the most scary thing. So let me tell you a little bit about how you do that, how you pitch to win, but how you tell your story. And it's very simple. Um, the first thing you've got to know, and it's already what I've talked about, and this is one of my favorite quotations, quotation by Nancy Duarte, and take a moment to read it. <laughs> and isn't that the truth of it? <laughs> How many times do we prepare presentations for anyone? The one we did last week. I guarantee you, and I don't do this, I used to do it. If someone asked you next week to come and present, the first thing you would do is, is dig out a previous presentation. Isn't that what you'd do? What you should do is always start afresh. Think of who the audience is, what are they interested in, what will make their connection. And also the thing that's really good about this is as a result of that, you'll enjoy the presentation much more because you won't be bored because you'll have recreated it. Now I'm not to say you'll have to start completely from flesh, you will use some of the previous stuff, but always start with a blank page. Start with who is my audience and what am I going to do for them, who, whom it may concern. Now, question for you. Who is a hero in your life? Who is the superhero in your life? And I'm, I'm thinking the sort of people I'm talking about now are sort of parents, sports coach, teacher, um, older brother, older sister. If you, when you think of that person who stands out in your life, it may be your first boss, it may be your sales manager, whatever that is, jot down their initials if you would. Just write down their initials. Who is a hero? Jot down their initials. You've done that? Now my question to you now, and Diane, if you just do it in a couple of words, what were the qualities that that person had? A couple of words, qualities. Now, 
Who'll tell me? You can tell me who the person is if you like, but I'm more interested. What qualities have you written down? What have you written down? Just give me some examples. Flair. Sorry? Flair. Flair. Okay. Passion. Passion. Who else? What have you written down? Honest. Honest. Honesty. Loyal. Who else? Loyal. Empathy. Empathy. Informed. Informed. Fairness. Fairness. Okay, would these be qualities you'd like people to see in you when you speak to them, when you connect with them, when you engage them? Would you like to see passion, empathy, fairness, loyalty, those sort of things? Interestingly, I think in the boom of the Celtic Tiger, what I would have got was hard-nosed and ruthless and aggressive and all of that sort of stuff. And I think we've started to realize that that wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And really, these are the qualities that sort of leaders show um, good people show are those sort of qualities, truth, empathy, loyalty. Now, in terms of presenting and coming to present to people, are they the qualities you'd like people to see in you? They are, aren't they? Say yes, Andrew, nod. Come on, yes, Andrew, yes, they're the qualities you'd like to see. And the difficulty is, and this is where I'm working with people, often we are, but because the most scary thing you can do is stand up here and do what I'm doing now, you hide them because you're nervous, because you're a little bit uncomfortable, uh, because it's not your natural environment. So people don't see the honesty and they don't see the empathy and they don't see the trustworthiness because what they may see is someone who's slightly nervous, which can be interpreted as being shifty, being uncomfortable, being untrustworthy. So it's hugely important that you can come and be yourself and be comfortable here and let people see who you really are and let people see the values that you really have. And that's what I help people to do more than anything else, is just simply come and tell your story and be yourself. Not try to be a poor imitation of your sales manager or your boss or somebody else you saw, but come and be yourself. Show the qualities that you are important to. And the basics for doing that, uh, and I use these two people as good examples. You've heard Neil O'Brien talk here numerous times, and Brian would always, uh, Neil would always talk about the basics of sport. And I'm now going to talk to you a little bit about that, because what Paul O'Connell would say, or what, or what uh, Horik Harrington would say was, <clears throat> It's a matter of getting back to the basics. It's a matter of doing the basics right. We didn't get our line outs right. The scrum collapsed too often. We've got to go back and work on that. Porrick Harrington, God, Porrick at the moment, there's a million reasons why he's not getting the basics right. But that's what he needs to do, is go back and get the basics right. And the other two things about these two people is they're also very open and honest when they are interviewed. You don't get the cliches. You listen to Tiger Woods and he speaks for two minutes and he said the same stuff. Every time he's ever been interviewed, he just keeps telling you the same thing. These people are open and honest. They're truthful. They tell you the real stuff. They tell you what's on their mind. And that's what a good speaker should do. And the basics for presenting are very simple. The basics are you must open, and in the first 20 words or seven seconds, you must get the audience's attention. Simple as that. Now, if you think about it, when you arrived in here, you weren't saying, oh, this is Andrew Kyo and Aristo, this is terrific, this is great. You were saying, I have three emails to send, I shouldn't be here this morning, there was a meeting I needed to go to, have the kids been picked up and brought to crash? There's a million things on your mind, as opposed to just listening to me. So I've got to do something right at the beginning to get you switched on, get you listening to me. And that's what every good speaker's got to do. Then in the body of the speak, what's going to happen? They're going to listen, they're going to drift off, they're going to listen, they're going to drift off, they're going to listen, they're going to drift off. And you've got to keep bringing them back. You've got to say, saying or doing interesting things, that brings them back. No one can hold someone's attention undivided for 45 minutes. It doesn't happen. And at the end, you've got to say at the end, this is how you're better as a result of what I'm suggesting to you. This is what it is. It's a take-home message that they, they need to remember. It's the same thing. This is the guy who said he could solve our parking problems. This is the guy who said we won't have a problem with the MRSA chillers because they understand and know them. So what is the final message that you want to say? But the basics are very simple. Get attention, 20 words, 7 seconds. Finish the conversation by saying, so as a result of what I'm suggesting to you, let me tell you how you're better. They're the basics. Who does that well? <clears throat> newspapers. Newspapers do that really well. You, you buy a newspaper depending on the headline. Let me give you an example of some headlines. <laughs> Would you buy the paper? <laughs> <clears throat> Freddie Starr ate my hamster. Not a bit of truth and it made his career. Made his career, made him famous. 
Would you buy the paper? <laughs> and the, my favorite one of all, <clears throat> Super Cali Go Ballistic Celtic are atrocious. <laughs> That's what newspapers do, what, that's what good speakers do. Get your attention right at the beginning and get your attention ideally with a message that has a bit of humour, a bit of fun in it, or is a headline that grabs your attention. <clears throat> and the close should say, again, read the quote. What happens with most of us, and you'll, you'll verify this, <clears throat> is we start to preparing the talk. We gather a whole lot of stuff together. We get pictures, we get slides, we talk to people, we pull in stuff from other ones, we get bits out of other ones, everything else. We spend hours doing all of this sort of stuff. And by the time it comes towards the end, you're exhausted and you're bored of it. And invariably what happens is you say, oh, I'll just stick anything in. I'm just fed up with this. And the reality is when you're preparing the talk, you should always start with the end. Start with the end in mind. Go back to Stephen Covey. Seven habits of highly effective people. Start with the end in mind. So the first thing you do is you say, how do I want this talk to end? How am I going to tell my client that they're better as a result of what I'm suggesting? So you have to start with the end. So we have an opening. We have a really good end that says this is how you're better. I was doing this recently and I said, ten, year, 10 years ago would you have said Father Ted was the funniest, wackiest television series we ever made. And then I realized that Jeremy Morgan is 16 years dead, which is, is scary. So it's 20 years since Father Ted was on. But it's still, I think it would be fair to say, one of the funniest, one of the original, most wacky comedy series ever. Would that be right? Fair to say? But let me tell you what Graeme Lenehan says about it. Graeme Lenehan says, it's despite the fact that Father Ted was basically in Irish only fools and horses. And you say, oh, it's only fools and horses. Where does that come from? And then he simply says, it's the same setup. It's a silly young guy. It's a middle-aged guy who thinks he's streetwise. And it's a doddery old guy. And you go, well, that's only fools and horses. Oh. And the genius of Graham Lenehan is that he hides the template. He's taken a classic comedy template, and he's put his style on it. He's put his twist on it. That's what he's done. And what they're now doing, the show they were doing recently was called The IT Crowd. And he says, the IT Crowd is using the template of Seinfeld. Seinfeld template, all we've done is we've added computers. Our twist is we've added computers. Seinfeld template, and if you think of the number of television series that are this way, the Seinfeld template is two guys and a girl. The number of television series that use two guys and a girl. So that's what he's done. So in the same way, what I do is give you a classic template for pitching. And the classic template for pitching must finish with, you must force for it, how is this audience better as a result of what I'm suggesting? <coughs> then how do I make a connection? And you do that by knowing who your audience is. You can't make the connection unless you know who your audience is. When you know who your audience is, then you can start to prepare. And let me tell you, what have I got in time left? Three minutes, okay. What have I got in time left? Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> Audience, now the preparation isn't all the stuff you did the night before and the day before. The preparation is your life's experience. I was talking to these guys over here from, who are from Flowgas, and they put me right on several things in two minutes because they have a life experience of working with this company and they know it inside out and they know the product inside out. So your preparation is your, your 20 years or your 10 years in business, it's not the five minutes or the night before that you did, the midnight before. That's not what it is. So then, very simply, what you need to do is tell the audience what the problem is that you solve, how you do that, who's the team that's going to do that, and how are they better, and then finally, call for an action. What's the action? The biggest number one failing of all people who present to the audience is at the end of the pre presentation, the audience doesn't know what's required of them, what's expected of them. So all I do is give you an opening, give you a close, and give you a classic template. That's what I work with people to do. Design classic templates and put their style on it. Take a moment just to read that. See when that was written? Nothing's new. Everything's the same. So the reality is that your job as salespeople to come over 
to overcome the issue of the other people are cheaper. That's your skill. There's no fun in selling if you just turn up and say, we're the cheapest, give us the order. The fun is when you do that, when you overcome the obstacles of price and win the business. That's your job. When you do that, this is the judgment listeners will make about you. Do I believe, do I trust this person? My final advice to you is speak from your life's experience, speak with energy and enthusiasm, and speak in terms of the listener's interests. And if you do that, they will. Thank you very much. One final slide. There's always one final slide. That's what Neil O'Brien says about me. I think most of you would agree, Neil O'Brien is probably one of the best speakers we have here over the years. That's what Neil says about me. So if you want to be of the same standard as Neil O'Brien, you want to be better at communicating, come and talk to me. Thank you very much.